says you can't turn all heat to work. Work to heat is fine, and that's exactly how everything ends up, but heat to work is a big no-no. And I'm sorry, this is a bit of a struggle for me to explain, but I'm going to do the best I can. And the way to start is I want to draw the magic cylinder and tell you about heat to work the very first time I told you about it. And so here's the plunger and the magic cylinder. And anyway, so we're going to, we're going to push, we're going to do a compression. And remember I said, I, I introduced you to heat and work via internal energy. And I said that molecules don't really see the difference between heat and work because they get, if I'm going to push the magic cylinder in, the molecules just, they get hit over the head, right? Maybe this one was barely moving, but it got, sorry, uh, let, let me, let me see more, I get my drawing. Uh, it gets hit over the head, and maybe this one wasn't moving at all, and it gets hit over the head. This one was barely moving, but it gets hit over the head. Uh, the same with this one, it gets hit over the head. Now uh, one more. Okay, so the molecules don't care. They have more energy, and that's why they don't really distinguish between heat and work as long as they get hit over the head, whether the, the thing, uh, the, the magic cylinder, the plunger is hot, and so therefore it's shaking or it's actually moving. The difference is only to the outside observer what the difference is, uh, because whether this thing is shaking or actually coherently moving, the molecules don't register the difference. Only I, as the outside observer, does. So I look at this, if you show me this, and you snap, you know, show me the vectors, but don't move anything, don't let the magic cylinder move, I can see that there is an, an event called work happening, because all the molecules are moving with coherence. They're all moving backward. And it says to me that this wasn't heat that got them moving, it was work because of their motion. I can tell. However, you know, in contrast to heat, Heat is just motion, that's greater energy via motion, but it's like busy bees, it's all over the place, it's all random. I, again, I can tell, as the outside observer, I can tell the difference this is work, because it's not all random. This is the source of the second law. How long does this occur, do you think? What's gonna happen? They're, they're gonna keep, now remember, there's other molecules in here, right? If it was empty, what the heck am I doing? How long does this coherent motion last? What do you think happens? Yeah, not very long. Right, what happens is, bamboo, these things start changing direction in ways that uh, oh, I'm sure have, you know, I'm sure there's a big equation that tells you exactly how the motion changes over time. But to an outside observer with, with a tenth of a mole, 10 to 23 molecules, whatever, it's random. It didn't start out random, but it ended random. And it did so really quickly. How quickly? How fast does it take? for this work motion to turn into random heat motion. And uh, so that's what I'm asking is how, is what and how fast, how fast this randomization takes uh, for a gas. Again, I've coherently started working on atoms by smacking them over the head in a single direction. But in, in the gas phase, in 10 to the minus nine seconds, they have randomized. I looked this up, by the way. These are accurate numbers. 10 to the minus 9 seconds, they, I, I look at them, so sorry, at time zero, I look at them, and there's work. And 10 to the minus 9 seconds later, it's, it's this, it's heat, as far as I can tell. Again, coherent motion versus random motion. The coherent motion randomized to 10 to the minus 9 seconds. If you think that, can, uh, now, by the way, how fast can, uh, your, the time it takes you to literally think has been measured. Any idea how fast it is? Much faster than the engine. Uh, no, much slower. No, much, <laughs> much slower. About a millisecond, right? 10 to the minus 3 seconds is as fast as you can think. Maybe that's because you're a little slow. But anyway, okay, so what about a liquid? So maybe it gets better. No, you run into things faster. All right, so that's, that's impossibly fast. If it's a solid, of course, the situation is, is even worse, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. The source of the second law is the fact that this motion randomizes really, really, really quickly. And that's why uh, you can't turn all to work. And let, let me, um, oh, God, how else do I want to put this? Um, 
Let me, let me, uh, so I, I hope my little drawing kind of explains that. This is work turning to heat, which is of course very efficient, but the reverse cannot be true. If, if, if this is quick, then the reverse, all, all the heat turning into work is, is inefficient. Let me, let me draw that occurring, but let me first show you how this is traditionally uh, expressed uh, in terms of these little diagrams which are in your book. You'll see this, everyone gets this diagram which is a diagram of a change in heat and how it's related to a change in work. And of course, something has to be hot, and then at the end of the process, something would be cold. Just like, you know, all of that gas burning in your car, if that simply turned entirely into heat, it would melt your engine. That's why engines occasionally melt, because something went wrong and all that heat built up and the engine melted. Actually, that car I saw kept on fire. After the fire was done, actually, the engine was completely destroyed. So the reason that doesn't happen is that the engine didn't get too hot. Um, some of the heat turned to, to cold. That's OK, it's still relatively hot. OK, now what happens is you want all this heat, this hot stuff, to turn into all work. Now remember, this is the work, work site. But it can't. It can't because of this fast randomization of motion. Uh, what really happens is you get you get a double. Um, it goes both. It goes two ways. Again, we always start our engines, our power plants start by burning gas or nuclear fuel or coal, whatever, and we get some work out of that. The crankshaft turns, the turbine turns, to generate electricity, but there is waste heat, always. This is not a matter of building a better mousetrap or perfect engine. A perfect engine still loses some of that burn energy to just uh, hot hood of the car. It is unavoidable that the top of your hood of your car is going to get hot. You cannot avoid this, and this is the second law. Okay, now, uh, I, I, this again is a little bit of an example of turning work to heat, and that obviously is going to happen. My point is that the reverse cannot happen, and that, that's because this random motion, it, it can't de-randomize and push back. I mean, that's clearly, clearly wrong. So let me, um, yeah, let me try to explain that. Um, again, I've shown all work to heat. Let me, let me, do, let me do heat to work. So in, in this example, I pushed on the magic cylinder, and those molecules, which were buzzing around like bees, because time, this much time has passed, which has happened many times since I've been speaking, those molecules are now moving around like crazy, right? And, um, and more so than before I compressed the cylinder because I put energy in the form of work, right? So now, here's the thing. I have now ex exerted some energy to do this. Those molecules are moving around like crazy, but they could push me back. They could do that, but they had to get their act together. All that random motion, all those times they got hit, knocking them, knocking them over here, making them go crazy. If they could get their act together and start hitting the plunger back as efficiently as I hit them, it would actually, it would actually push me back. And that will happen when begins with an N and sounds like ever. It's never, never right. <laughs> That will never happen. Okay, so now let me let me look at turning uh, heat to work then, and, and show you why this happens. Okay, so I've got the magic cylinder, and I'll actually draw the uh, the plug at the end. And here's the um, here's the plunger, and now this is attached to like a crankshaft of an engine or something like that. And the molecules inside of here, I'm going to heat them, so I'll like this, so this is heat, and it comes from burning something, uh, gas, I guess. And the molecules, of course, that, that generates pressure, and the molecules start doing this. And, and uh, yeah, that's why that's why the plunger gets pushed out, and that's why, uh, sorry, the plunger is attached to a crankshaft that turns the wheels, your car is now in motion. Congratulations. The problem is, is that some of that heat got the molecule to do this, too. Right? The molecules went the wrong direction. I need them to go to the right. Take that heat and turn right. But half of them chose not to do so. Uh, maybe it's even a little bit worse than just half, right? 
So that's why all that heat isn't going to turn into work. Because again, they would have to move with a purpose and they're dumb little bees. They don't know how to do that. So again, that's why I have this diagram the way I've done this. Um, these guys push my car down uh, the road. These guys make my uh, hood warm. And it, again, it's unavoidable, just like this little picture I drew, which you know is true. Even if you applied in middle school, you would have guessed that once you even knew what molecules were. Uh, so anyway, that's my best description of why the second law works the way it does. And with this, I want to get into engine design, which I, hopefully will be kind of interesting. Uh, this could be a little, little painful. Uh, but I'm going to actually cover engine efficiency. Okay, so well, we're about to do this huge calculation of engine efficiency. It's actually going to spill over to Monday's lecture because this takes so long, unfortunately and it's a little painfully detailed. Okay, so it turns out that this guy, Sadie, Sadie Carnot, he was a cannoneer, apparently that's a thing. In, um, let's see, I've got, in 1850, he was actually one of Napoleon's guys, and he, he's blowing cannons up every day, shooting at the English or whoever, French. Uh, so, working for Napoleon, he's a cannoneer, and unlike the other people who, you know, are terrified when they see people flying around in balloons, he's looking at this cannon and he's like, hey, I wonder why this damn thing is so good at blowing people up, you know? It wasn't enough for him just to blow people up, which would have been fine by me. <laughs> he wants to know why it works so well and why, the, you know, the ball comes shooting out of the barrel every time he lights a fuse. So, um, he actually figured out a lot of things about, uh, about entropy and how engines work. And what was very clever about him was that he figured out that of all the ways you could build an engine, you really got two good ways of doing this. One is a toy. Your, your wind-up toys, which are basically in some form or another a rubber band, whether the rubber band is like a metal spring or literally a rubber band like those little planes you flew, you could wind it up and release it later. But Carnot knew that of all the types of machines you could ever build, that that blows, right? Why? Because, I mean, it's obviously it blows. He knew that an efficient engine that anyone would ever want would actually function by this principle. It would work by a crankshaft. Let me, um, let me draw that as well as I humanly can, which is not great. So, uh, okay, so a crankshaft is going to have, uh, well, it's going to look like this if I can draw it right. And I swear I'm doing my best, but this is kind of difficult. Okay, what am I doing? Um, no, I screwed up. There we go. Uh, no, sorry. I usually do okay with this. You can look at my, I actually keep my other videos from other years so that I make sure that I'm um, following, you know, that I'm on track. So anyway, usually I do a little bit better job with drawing this doing a terrible job today. But anyway, crunch up, right? Uh, a reciprocating device. That's what he figured out was that, God, that's terrible. But anyway, I hope you get the point. The point is, is that a wind-up device is just blows for obvious reasons. What you want is some way to create a reciprocating engine. This handle that I can hold on to, and that the, the center camshaft will, will spin, and of course that turns your wheels of your car, yada, yada, yada. The point is, is that the engine needs to reciprocate. Now in the process, he basically discovered entropy, he didn't name it, but he basically discovered entropy, um, kind of, and then later Clausius figured all of this out, and he did anyway, blah, blah, blah. What was kind of funny about him, because I like telling these stories, was that apparently he was going around, remember, 1850s France, and they had just figured out stuff like you should wash your hands and you shouldn't touch dead bodies, not lick them like they used to do, or touch them for good luck. Uh, he's going around telling everyone that he's figured out something huge. It, it might have been entropy or maybe it was nuclear weapons. No one really knows. Maybe it's quantum mechanics. And then he falls over dead right in the middle of the town. He had cholera. Right? That was a big problem. Then people just killed over dead. And the people had just figured out not to touch him. Right? <laughs> Big invention. Not to touch him and not to go into his house where his notes were, they burned it down. That was a smart thing to do, but no one knows what he discovered. And you think, we could have, Napoleon, 
could have had nuclear weapons, which would have been crazy. <laughs> elected. But anyway, um, so no one knows what he came up with, but what we do know that he did come up with is that, that an engine to ever be useful must be reciprocating, and he figured out things about how efficient that engine could be and how it could work practically, which is what I'm covering for right now. Okay, now, again, for practical reasons, you want a reciprocating engine, but now let's think about connecting that to the magic cylinder, and the magic cylinder, um, the magic cylinder is gonna expand in what's called a power stroke, by the way, and this is engine design, by the way. So again, you know, here's the piston, the magic piston, which has gas in it, and of course, you know, the explosion of gasoline drives it up, so that turns the camshaft here, that's called the power stroke, comes back down, and bambo, uh, more power, power stroke back down. Go round and round and round, that drives your car. Okay, so now ultimately I have to think about the magic piston. Let's not worry about this anymore. I have to think about the magic piston, and of course it has to expand. Let's do it this way. And again, that's the upswing, that's the power stroke. Now, here's the crazy problem that Carnot figured out that these engines would have, and that is that they have to come back. Right, the engine has to reciprocate. It has to start where it began and keep doing so, yet produce a net work. By the way, I didn't mention this before, but it wants to produce a net negative work. Because just like, as you understand, the power stroke needs to be an expansion in the cylinder, it's a practical thing that we can't really figure out how to draw power from the cylinder going compressing. Expanding is easy to imagine how this makes the wheels turn, but compressing, I don't know how you would do that. What, what chemical reaction do you set off quickly gets cold and, and eats up gas versus the opposite? What chemical reactions do you know get hot and produce lots of gas, right? Burning gets hot, produces lots of gas. There are reactions that consume gas and get cold, but they're very rare. So, practically speaking, we want to expand, we want our engines to generate net negative work. Now, my issue with this is, what do you think the net, and remember, area under the curve, what do you think the net negative work is? All right, if you're not sure, tell you what, let me, um, let me take the two processes and add up the work. Remember, works just add. If they're negative or positive, that's their problem. NRT, LN, uh, BF over BI. Okay, so that's the expansion. And I'm going to add to that um, uh, NR, add, but it's negative, that's fine. LN, BI over BF. Okay, what is this equal to? Can you tell? It's zero. Why? What's ln A over B is equal to minus ln B over A? Sound familiar? Um, because this, I, I'm not going to write that what I just said. Hopefully you know that ln B over A is equal to minus ln uh, A over B. Okay, so you see what I did? I just flipped B, F, and B, I and I put a minus sign in front, minus, minus is plus, minus this plus the same thing as zero. Okay, again, the problem is, is that Carnot knows that there's wound up rubber band automobiles below, he figured that back out in 1850, he was right. You need to have a reciprocating engine, but he's got a problem. All right, so the thing is, if your car engine worked by this principle, you could get a stroke, but when you reciprocate, the car engine would stall. That, that's absolutely true. This literally does not work. The network is negative. You could get it to turn once, but it would never turn again. And that's pointless. Okay. There's no net work, and by the way, we want net negative work. The negative work of expansion, that's good. That's the power stroke, was completely consumed in the contraction, which is bad. That's our loss. Now, remember, uh, for you graphical people, graphical people tend to figure out the conundrum. How, how do you get this to not do this? Graphical people tend to be a little bit best at this. Uh, okay, so remember, the area under the curve is the work. Don't worry about the minus sign so much. The area under the forward swing is a number. The problem is, is that the area going back is the same. 
again, don't worry about pluses and minuses. How can I make this isotherm for the back be less? How can I do that? I need to drop this thinner line, the return stroke. I need to drop it. I need that, that positive work. I need that area under the thinner line to be less. How do I do that? How would I do that to an isotherm to drop the amount of work? I gave the answer twice already. Okay, folks. Pressure volume, the pressure is, you know, the pressure tracks the, the forward swing on the back swing, but I need it to be less. I need there to be less pressure in this isotherm. How would I do that? What can I do to a gas? You now remember, the volume of the cylinder, the volume of the piston is fixed. What can I do at a constant volume to drop pressure of a gas? What, drop what? Drop the temperature. Right. Here's what you do. OK, you've done the, the power stroke, the expansion stroke. You turn the camshaft halfway. You wheel to half turn. Then what you do is you drop the temperature, do your return, and then heat it back up. There you go. You see? Now, here's your positive work, which is the compression. And here's your negative work, which is the expansion, which is the, the power stroke. The power stroke net negative area work, so the same thing, is greater than the loss positive work of the, you know, so again, the negative work of the expansion is now a greater negative number than the corresponding positive loss of work, which is technically a compressive positive work. Uh, so you're getting net negative uh, amount of work out. And again, negative work is good work. That it's easier, another way to think about this is that it's easier to get pushed down the street than pulled, right? Again, car engine design is designed to push you down the road, not pull you down the road. It's just a practical thing, just like cam pistons are anyway. Um, so uh, let me remind you uh, how that works. And um, actually, I will tell you a little bit more about car engine designs, because uh, cars actually have been designed with different principles. There's the Carnot principle, which is what you're getting. There is a diesel principle, by the way, and there is an auto principle, uh, OTEO for the person that named that. And I'm just kind of smarting over the fact that I, I really did a bad job drawing the um, drawing the camshaft. So I just want to again remind you how this is going to work. So uh, this part is this part. This part is this part right here. And ultimately, this is connected to the uh, piston. Uh, right here, which is the part of your car. Okay, so here's the uh, magic plunger. Uh, you can see plungers. I've, I've seen cars taken apart, so there you go. And this is the part where there's gas exploding. And there you go. And anyway, so you can see how the expansion will turn the camshaft. Of course, the thing has to be down. But anyway, I don't know about yeah, just kind of rambling here. All right, so therefore, for a practical reciprocating engine, you expand, expand hot, and then a compress cold. Okay, so that's Carnot's trick. That's how he figured out a reciprocating engine could work really well. And again, to continue with my discussion of actual car engines, you know the heat is generated. The expanding hot gas comes from burning gasoline, <laughs> gas, gas, right? The cold compressed, how do you do that? So, so all engines have a hot block and a cold block. What's the cold block on a car? It's on the outside. It can be all shiny and chromey and have lots of it's the tailpipe. No, it's not the radiator. That's different. It's the tailpipe. Remember that when you do a compression, there's valves and stuff on here that allow the gas to go to the tailpipe. And tailpipe pipes on fancy cars are not down the center. That's just up for practical reasons. On a hot rod, they're out the side. And they're huge, aren't they? It's a thermal block. That's why they're on the outside, so that they cool quickly. 
Fancy cars have big, huge tail pipes. That way it dissipates the heat faster. If it can do that, as you're about to see, it's going to make the engine more efficient. Anyway, so all this stuff I'm telling you, actually I can point to an actual vehicle and point out to that and say, that's why this is here, because of the stuff I'm showing you right now. Okay, now a Carnot cycle is a principle of engine design that all engineers strive for, although some people do actually build cars on auto cycles and diesel cycles. Carnot engines are the best design. So I'm going to show you how to do that. By the way, take out a page. This is big. This is huge. I'm going to draw, draw that diagram I just drew and just erased, a P versus D. Uh, and it's going to be really big, all right? So uh, again, you're going to need a whole page to do this. So this is the Carnot cycle. And yes, this is very large because I need lots of room because I'm going to do a gas expanding and compressing in a circle and I'm going to analyze every piece. So we're going to start at uh, P1, V1, E hot because this has, um, the gas has burned. Okay, there's an expansion to P2, V2, but we're still hot. Okay, isothermal or adiabatic? Isothermal. Iso isothermal. The heat has not changed. It's hot. It started hot. It ended hot. Okay. Again, a expansion. This is the power stroke. Uh, this is the work coming out. This is the wheels. You know, this is when the wheels first start grinding against the, the uh, ground, right? Okay. So, uh, and we're going to make it reversible as well. Now, here's the clever trick. Now, you know I have to drop temperature. I got to do that for the reasons I've just been explaining for the last 20 minutes. But Carnot knew that you could still expand and drop temperature at the same time. Now, before I just did a straight line drop, that's not so smart. Not if you can still get expansion. Expansion is good, right? Remember, expansion is negative work. That's the wheels turning. Carnot knew you could expand and still cool. How do you do that? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You raise the volume? No, 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 no. Type of, all right, so we just did an isothermal expansion. Drop, drop the heat. Right, to drop the heat, we're going to expand, but how? Not isothermally? Adiabatic. Adiabatic. Do an adiabatic expansion, right? Adiabatic expansion. And remember, adiabats actually slope harder than uh, isotherms because they're cooling. So remember, Expanding gas is cool, even hydrogen and helium, um, because they're not in Joule Thompson devices. I just gave the answer to the homework anyway. And so we're at a new pressure, uh, P3, B3. Uh, now, we're, now we're cold. And then we're going to do the same um, ISO. We still have to compress. We have to compress, and that's going to go to P4, V4. Uh, uh, we're going to do an isothermal compression, and then we're going to do an adiabatic compression to get back hot again. So anyway, so this is the cycle. This is the Carnot cycle, and now let's break it down to every step. And, uh, and I haven't told you this, but the idea that what, what I'm actually trying to do here is I'm trying to calculate the engine efficiency. Um, I haven't said that because I know that I have to do a lot of things before I get there. Regardless. Isothermal adiabatic expansion, isothermal compression, adiabatic compression. That's what I'm doing with everything we know, which is to calculate the work in the first step, which would be minus the uh, heat in the first step, because this is isothermal. Uh, this is isothermal, and isothermal uh, work is minus the heat, regardless. And of course, I know that this is reversible, and our T. Um, say work has a minus sign, sorry about that. And I remember that it's hot, and then natural log, uh, the final volume is V2, the initial volume is V1. Okay, and that's about all I really need to say about that. The next adiabatic expansion, well, I do, uh, there's no heat exchange, okay, uh, but there is work, of course, there's still work. 
let's call that work two, and that is, remember, uh, that will be the heat capacity times the change in temperature, which will be the uh, cold minus hot, remember that's final minus initial. That's all I've got there. Okay, again, another isothermal step. This is a compression. Uh, regardless, the heat, uh, which is the third heat, will be minus, uh, sorry, minus, let me, let me, minus the heat will be the work of the third step, which will be uh, minus nRT cold. Sorry, I, I kind of, you see how I painted my, I, I didn't even give myself enough room already. Anyway, uh, final, final volume is V4. Initial volume is V3. And again, I didn't give my enough silicone <coughs> here. Okay, in that final adiabatic compression, there is no heat exchange. That's why it gets hot again. Uh, of course, the work, the fourth step, is going to be the heat capacity, assuming it's the same gas, uh, times T. Final is hot minus T cold. Again, sorry I'm using the micro letters here. You're probably having trouble seeing that. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll prepare a handout on this because this is a lot to take in. If you screwed up your um, sheet of paper like I screwed up the board, maybe this isn't fitting. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me toss this up here. I'm going to do my analysis so you can keep looking at that while I add up the work. And by the way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up the work. Remember, I, I've said this a couple of times. I know this is like one of those things that you haven't experienced before. But energy can't be created or destroyed, so I'm going to add up the work uh, because because I should. You know, you know, if it takes X amount of energy to turn left and right, even though you didn't go anywhere, you still need to add that up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that by the heat that was added. So I'm going to add up the work and divide that by the heat, and that's going to be the engine efficiency because all engines start with the burner. That's the energy input. I want it to turn into work, that's the energy output. So I'm going to add up the work, which is a net negative because of our clever drop the heat trick, uh, our Carnot trick, that's nice. So I'm going to get a net negative work, and I'm going to divide that by the amount of heat, and that's the engine efficiency. Why? Because all engines begin with a burn. Right? So anyway, let's, um, let's add up the total work. Total change in work will be the change in, excuse my uh, shorthand, uh, but the, the three, uh, sorry, the four steps. Sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so that's why my handwriting's bad. Now, now remember, don't ever worry about, wait, do I add the first and second and subtract the third and fourth because those are, no, 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 no. You just add them together. If they choose to be negative or positive, that's their problem. You just add them, all right? So, and this is minus NRT hot. Natural log V2 over V1 uh, plus CV uh, T cold, which is the final temperature, minus the initial temperature, which is hot. And uh, then I've got uh, add in the other, the work three, which is negative. So adding in a negative is subtracting. Uh, of course, this was done at a cold temperature. And the final volume was V4, initial was V3. And then I've got that last adiabatic step where the final temperature was hot, the initial temperature was cold. There we go. I'm just doing that off the top of my head, but I'm pretty, yep, that's correct. And I see I can immediately eliminate two terms. How do I, what do I do? What can I eliminate? The CVs, this and this. Right, they're opposite, right? Because again, you add them together, but it looks like the work four was the net was negative actually, right? <coughs> uh, cold minus hot, hot minus cold, right? That, that's where that's coming from. Okay, so um, again, you add them up. That the fact that the work four was the negative of work two was what it decided, and that's again because we're in a cycle. Okay, so the net negative work is um, minus n r. I'm going to do some factoring. T hot ln V2 over V1 uh, plus T cold ln V4 over V3. 
Okay, uh, little bracket. The next bit is that I'm fairly certain that I can simplify this further. I mean, it's kind of screaming to be simplified. And that's because V2 and V3, I'm looking up at the graph, V2 and V3 are connected by an adiabatic expansion. V1 or v, and V4 are related by an adiabatic uh, compression in the fourth leg. So again, V2 and V3 are in step two, the adiabatic expansion. V1 and V4 are related to the adiabatic compression. So my thinking is that I can turn this V4 into V3 into uh, V1 into V2, right, if I just figure out how they're related. Now, uh, fortunately, I know that, um, uh, let's see. Uh, now, again, you know, I, I hate having to do this, but I'm going to do another derivation off to the side, and I'm going to put it back into here. Again, adiabatic expansion, adiabatic compression. Let's do that. So V2 over V3. So I'm going to write the adiabatic equations of state. Uh, let's see. Um, this was initial volume over final volume. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the temperatures. Initial over final, final over initial. So that's T. Um, sorry. Initial over final, final, which is cold, right? Yeah. Uh, because this is the cooling leg over initial. I, I just um, I just remember that these are flipped from each other, and again I'm looking at my notes. Okay, I know that this is true, and now I can clearly see that I'm going to be able to relate these suckers because V4 over V3. Again, now let, let me see. This is final over initial is got to be uh, final over initial, so the initial is T cold. Uh, wait, no, no, no. No, no, they're flipped. Okay, V4 is related to, um, um, blah, 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 blah. right, so I think I got, um, I think I'm with my notes. V, whoa, 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 what am I doing? V4 and V1, that's why I'm confused. Two and three, four and one. My bad, my bad, my bad, and my bad. Okay, so this should be T hot, right? Is that right? I feel like I'm getting confused here. Is that correct? Okay. I have to admit, I'm a little bit blind right now, uh, probably because I've been talking for too long. CB, R. Okay, again, sorry if you're having trouble seeing this. Here you go. Again, total work. I'm pretty sure I can relate the Vs. And sure enough, if I look at the adiabatic equations of state, um, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, thanks for that. It's actually, I'm still confused by <laughs> I don't know why, uh, V I D F T F T I V F T I. If that's the final volume, that's, that's the final volume, that's the initial volume, that's the, sorry, sorry, my bad, right, I, I got it flipped in my head, my bad. That's the initial volume, that's the final volume, that's the final temperature, that's the initial temperature. Sorry, it just got it flipped in my head. Okay, now what I can do here is I see that if I, um, let, let, me, uh, let me do this, V1 over V4 is therefore equal to T cold over T hot. Sorry, I'm not working the board so well. Uh, now I can see that, that V2 over V3 is equal to V1 over V4. So uh, I just took these adiabatic equations of state, I flipped this guy, and now I can see that V1 over V4 is equal to V2 over V3, and I need to get um, V2, uh, actually I want to get what I want. I want to get V4 over V3, uh, so I bring this over here, and that's equal to V1 over V2. Okay, so let me go back here. Um, and sorry, it's taking forever. Uh, this is minus NR. See, I told you I hate this day, because this just really gets detailed. I'm not going to mess with the, this guy, because I chose to get rid of uh, uh, V4 and V3. So this is too cold. Um, V4 over V3 uh, is 
the, you, know, you know what I'm going to have to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do another step of algebra in my head. Sorry, I didn't do such a good job with this. B4 over B3 is V1 over V2. So if I make that V2 over V1, I just pick up a minus sign. And I do that because now I've got my natural logs the same. And, um, and I can see that I very stupidly bring it out of the room. Um, I'll tell you what, let me, let me just go ahead and erase this so I can keep working down. I'm actually done with this diagram anyway. And, uh, and I'm going to just prepare a handout because I'm kind of really acting batty right now. That's because of normally I don't do two hours of lecture. <laughs> My handwriting isn't that great. So, okay, okay, I'm still doing the total work. Let me, I'm done now, so how it works is um, I can factor out uh, minus n r. The reason I did all this, by the way, is to factor this out. B2 over B1. And what I'm left is T hot minus T cold. Yes, I hear you too, by the way. Anyway, okay, that's the total work. Uh, question. Um, for, the, for the second part, the last set, uh, part you wrote at the top, is it supposed to be V2 over V1? And uh, why? Uh, no, okay, so yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm just not doing such a good job right now. That's why. Um, I use all the, uh, so uh, this one, yeah. all right, we're okay there. Now, again, the point is is that I, I'm fairly certain I can get rid of V4 and V3 and put V2 and V1. To do that, I did this adiabatic stuff, got them related. I said V4 over V3, which is what I'm trying to get to, is V1 over V2. Instead, I wrote V2 over V1, so I plugged in the minus sign. Ln oh, V over A, yeah. Ln B over A is minus oh, Ln A over I see. B. Okay. I, I skipped an algebra step. No, I was just confused. No, 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 no. Then if you're thinking that about 10 foot people, 20 other people are too. So uh, again, two algebra steps in one because I just kind of ran out of room. Okay, work total. Let's do heat. Okay, so what kind of student that I got rid of my diagram? Engine efficiency. Remember, the goal is engine efficiency. It is the work over the heat added. Now, it turns out that there were two heat steps. Remember, the uh, adiabatic parts, there's no heat exchange. The first step and the third step have heat. The first step is where there's uh, is where the engine hot. I had to have added that. I had to burn the gas, and that cost me money. This the third step is um, free. That's when the tailpipe opens. That's when the um, the cylinder opens to the tailpipe. One of them cost me money, and one of them didn't cost me anything. Burning gas costs money. Letting the gas out the tailpipe costs nothing. So that's why the heat added is not going to be the, the, the total. It's only the, um, it's only the first step, which is minus, uh, because that was an isothermal uh, expansion. That's NRT hot. Again, sorry I got rid of the, uh, the diagram. I'm regretting it now. LNV2 over one OK. Again, only the first isothermal expansion counts because I had to actively heat the gas to get it to expand. I had to burn gasoline, and that cost me money. The next heat, which I choose to ignore, I ignore it because it doesn't cost me anything just to let the gas out the tailpipe. That's that I don't pay anything for. Okay, so now the percent efficiency, by the way, is going to be the, the total change in work over the heat added. Notice that I put an absolute value. That's because um, the net work is negative, and we don't like negative efficiencies. So that's, sorry about that. Um, but I don't want to give you a negative number. OK, and that's T hot minus T cold. OK, I'm just rewriting the net work, but I had an absolute value sign, NRT. Uh, hot ln v2 v1 because again only the first step counts which is t hot 
times T cold over T hot, which is 1 minus T cold over T hot. Okay, so with this, uh, give me one more minute, and remember if you haven't picked up your homework, I am right here. This is as efficient an engine could get. Now for reasons I'll cover next time, a Carnot engine, an engine built on the Carnot cycle principle, is the best engine you could ever build, but it is not 100% efficient. Right? Now this represents how much energy that was input as heat was lost um, that did not get turned into work. If this number was 1, all the heat got turned into work. But this is never 1, right? <laughs> right? So, uh, again, all engines only have a finite efficiency. Now you might see why cars have big tailpipes, why sports cars have big tailpipes. Because if you can keep that tailpipe cold, your engine will be more efficient. Here's another good one. Airplanes fly at 30,000 feet. You know why? 30 to 40 to 50, sometimes 50,000 feet. Why not 100 feet? Okay, that's kind of scary. <laughs> why, uh, why not 1,000? You know, the wind won't knock you over. Why not 1,000? Does anyone know? <laughs> right, it's cold. At 30,000 feet, the atmosphere gets very, very cold. They fly at those heights to get their engine efficiency up. That's why they do it which is dangerous because if there's a decompression, you'll freeze to death. Now, the last thing I want to cover is, because I might put this on the test, I usually do, is that you may notice that that T cold was zero, you actually would have a perfectly efficient engine. I can't deny that this would turn into the number one, no matter, right, you either get the, either your gas burns infinitely hot, okay, that would work, but for practical reasons, no. <coughs> or you could make your uh, tailpipe infinitely cold, and if you could, that would be true. It's just not, unfortunately, it's not practical. And as I mentioned to you, aircrafts fly at 30,000 feet to get it the outside as cold as possible. Your vehicles are more efficient in the winter. By the way, that's true. Now, if the, if the interiors freeze, that's another problem. But let's look at this P versus D diagram to understand why at zero degrees, your engine efficiency would be perfect. Okay, now remember, we expand hot, but if the temperature of the tailpipe, remember the drop down, is zero, tell me what the pressure would be in the tailpipe. The pressure would be zero, right? Because if I take a, a box of gas, the gas in the tailpipe, and I bring that to zero degrees Kelvin, it ain't a gas anymore. Right? So the pressure is zero. The return is then done against a vacuum. See, here's the thing. Remember that the compression is, a, is your loss. Right? The, the return, the positive work. But if you can drive the pressure to zero, you can d divide that to zero, there's no work to compress into a vacuum. You don't lose anything. Again, the compression is your loss. The compressive work is a loss. But if you compress into a vacuum, that doesn't take any work at all. And you can create a vacuum by lowering the temperature to absolute zero. There ain't no gas. No gas is no pressure. So there you go. So therefore, all your net negative work, this area under the curve, is outmatched, sorry, is not outmatched to any degree, shape, or form by the net zero area under the return. The only problem is, is that uh, Zero degrees Kelvin is a hell of a thing, right? You're not, it's not practical. I mean, I thought about doing this. Attach your tailpipe to a refrigerator. I mean, and honestly, I'm kind of tempted to try it, but I'm not. Okay. Folks, I'm sorry this was really.